Hello. Um, I'm going to talk, as, as uh, Valerio said, I'm going to talk more about the way the data were analyzed um, to make this detection in, in, the, in the context of the uh, LIGO interferometers. So um, I hope my talk is going to be orthogonal enough to, uh, to the previous one. So I'm going to start with a little bit of introduction. So gravitational waves are um, a physical phenomenon which is predicted by Einstein's uh, relativity, which is the best theory we have nowadays to explain uh, gravity and the physical phenomena on a uh, macroscopic sc scale from this scale, from the scale of this room to um, astrophysics and cosmology. So central idea um, uh, of general re relativity is the idea of space-time. So it's a, uh, space-time is a, is a mathematical model representing the, the entire universe and uh, space and, and time are two different uh, dimensions of this, uh, of this four-dimensional um, mathematical model. And inside space-time, we have stars, matters, planets, energy, radiation, and everything that is contained in the universe lives inside this space-time. Space-time has a, has, a, has a geometry, which is represented by this grid in this uh, picture, which means we have a way of calculating distances between points in space-time. Uh, general relativity also has a set of equations, which are called Einstein's equation, which couple the geometry of space-time to the distribution of matter and energy inside it. So there is an effect, there is a, a back reaction of the distribution of matter and energy on the geometry of space-time, but at the same time, the geometry determines how um, uh, matter and energy move inside space-time. So there is this kind of feedback loop, um, which... Um, is very complicated mathematically and uh, is at the center of the description of uh, uh, dynamics in general relativity. Also, general relativity tells us that whenever we have curvature in the geometry of space-time, we have gravitational effects. So gravity is described as a uh, very precise mathematical uh, property of um, the geometry of space-time. Um, a major prediction of relativity is that if we somehow perturb the geometry, for example, by shaking the distribution of mass and energy in a certain part of space-time, this perturbation will propagate to the geometry of space-time and will be radiated away as waves, uh, which travel at the, at the speed of light, and uh, propagate, essentially, the information that this shaking happened um, at some point in space-time. This is what we call gravitational waves. This uh, theory was published 100 years ago, so it's quite remarkable that the detection was made uh, now in this period. So how do we generate uh, gravitational waves? Well, I am actually generating gravitational waves now as I am speaking to you and moving my, my body. But if we are talking about strong gravitational waves, then we need something much different than, than myself. We need something much heavier, which is not difficult, but um, we, uh, we need something like the, the mass of the star. Uh, we need to accelerate this mass to uh, relativistic velocity, so close to the speed of light, and then we need to change this, uh, this speed very violently. So, for example, with a uh, sudden collision between two very heavy objects or a rotation of a very heavy object or something like that. Um, and fortunately, this kind of phenomena cannot happen on Earth, otherwise we wouldn't be here. But that also means we cannot generate gravitational waves to study them. So we need some kind of violent astrophysical or um, cosmological phenomenon which radiates these gravitational waves and we need something to, to measure them here on Earth. Uh, there is one physical phenomenon in particular, which is a very efficient radiator of gravitational waves. So imagine uh, having a star, which can be a heavier version of our sun, for example. This star burns hydrogen and other elements, and the, this burning produces um, radiation, which balances the force of gravity that tends to squish the star into a, a single point. At some point, hydrogen finishes, and the pressure of gravity doesn't have anything else to balance it, so the star starts to contract. And if, if the star is heavy enough, then we don't know any physical interaction which can con um, contrast gravity. And essentially, the material collapses uh, forever. And at some point, we get a uh, compact object, which uh, can be, um, which is something that contains a lot of mass, like the mass of the sun or more, in a very small uh, uh, sphere, 
which is which has a radius of like 10 kilometers or so. So imagine something weighing many times the sun compressed into an object that is small, which has some kilometers. And this can be a black hole if the star is very heavy, or in other conditions can be a neutron star, which is a very special kind of star made essentially uh, basically all of neutrons. Um, many stars in the universe come in pairs, so come in binary orbits like this. And if you imagine applying this idea to each individual star in the binary, then we can end up with a binary of two black holes orbiting each other. This system has all the uh, requirements that I talked about in the previous slide. So it has heavy objects moving very fast and um, uh, accelerating in, in a circular motion. So it will radiate gravitational waves and will lose energy by radiating energy away in gravitational waves. So these objects will slowly spiral into each other, accelerate to relativistic velocities, and eventually touch each other, merge from a single black hole. And uh, this process is an extremely efficient radiator of gravitational waves. This is what LIGO instruments detected in September. And I will call this thing GW150914. So uh, how can we measure these kind of waves? Well, there, there was already the uh, very nice previous talk. I will just do some recapitulation here. So imagine taking a ring of particles. The effect of gravitational waves is to change the distance between these particles if these particles are in free fall. So the gravitational waves will squeeze the ring in this way, and then the next uh, cycle will be, become, again, uh, to the rest position. Then it will be squeezed in the other way, and then so on. This will oscill oscillate with the wave. So the way to measure these for example, is to take some mirrors, as was shown already, and suspend them in a very quiet environment, send some light between these mirrors, and measure the light travel time, essentially. This seems simple, but has been a major technological challenge and required many decades um, for this discovery. This is how uh, the LIGO interferometers look like. They are very similar to what has been shown before. Uh, before. So there is the laser, then there is a magic which cleans the laser beam and um, makes everything better. The laser beam is split by a beam splitter sent into two Fabripero cavities where the laser power resonates and builds up. The gravitational wave will um, change the length of the optical path in a sort of differential way. So we make one shorter and one longer. And when this happens, there will be a lack of cancellation of the, of the laser light here. So some light will leak out and with some more magic here, will be amplified and then detected by a photo detector. Then this goes through some very sophisticated and complicated electronics and digitized and saved um, to be analyzed. Um, this instrument requires a lot of much more complicated things than I depicted here. And in particular, as, um, as was said already, there is some actual con um, Python software, which keeps all these optical components aligned and keeps the, the instrument in a, uh, at the best operating condition. They will not talk much about this. So how, how do the data from such an instrument look like? So we have the main scientific product, which um, we have to analyze, which is the science data, which represents a time series, essentially a, a discrete time series of um, differential displacement, so differential displacements in the, in the mirrors, uh, which is called strain, or H of T, technically, because H is just the name we gave to this quantity. In LIGO, this is sampled at about 16 kilohertz, and uh, those are stored as double precision numbers. Uh, the useful frequency band is actually just between 20 and uh, 20 hertz and 2 kilohertz. Um, and uh, if you look at this data, it's basically dominated all the time by, by noise that is um, unavoidable in any um, instrument. And uh, this noise background has some very nice properties. Most of the time, it's quasi-stationary, quasi quasi-Gaussian, meaning that its statistical properties evolve slowly over time. Uh, but it also contains um, some very nasty instrumental artifacts. For example, there are a lot of uh, quasi monochromatic lines, for example, which come from resonances of the mechanical components. There are transients which come from 
many things from the interaction of the instrument with the environment it come from some uh, earthquakes or things shaking the interferometer, airplanes passing by, any kind of uh, uh, transient disturbance can in principle uh, affect the data. And of course, uh, the data also sometimes contain uh, astrophysics. So there are transient signals as the one that was discovered and other kinds of signals, continuous waves or even a stochastic background is expected, but all of these are, most of the time they are below the noise. So we need to dig them out of these data somehow. Uh, in addition, there are auxiliary channels which are connected to sensors spread around the whole interferometers, like seismometers, magnetometers, microphones. These are all associated with time series, sample at different rates, sometimes much less than 16 kilohertz, and they are necessary to investigate problems which affect the data, the main science data. For example, when we see a transient in the main science data, we can look at these auxiliary channels and see how ah, that's that's just one of the resonances being excited and propagating to the, to the science data. Um, a, a special file format has been designed for, this, for storing this kind of data. It's called FRAME or GWF. And uh, it's, uh, the data are packaged into these frames, frame files, and then these are shipped to different um, analysis sites, for example, and over where I work, uh, to be analyzed. This plot shows how the um, uh, power spectrum of the data looks like. So this is frequency, and on the y-axis you see the um, amplitude spectral density. So you can see that there is a noise floor, which is the quasi-stationary Gaussian noise, which goes up frequency because um, the uh, sensitivity of the interferometer low frequency is very bad, goes up at high frequency because no physical instrument can have infinite sensitivity at, at high frequency. And it, you can also see there are many lines. Some of them are, this one is, uh, I think this one is at 60 hertz, which if you think that it's an American instrument should tell you something. These are some mechanical resonances of the suspensions of the mirrors, and then many of these lines actually we have no idea what they are. Uh, you can also look uh, at uh, time frequency plots like this in the data. This is uh, a fraction of a second in time and some frequency band around the most sensitive band and most of the time, uh, you just see the Gaussian noise in the background, and this is an instrumental transient, which is called, this is called a blip glitch, and we have no idea where it comes from. It's in the data, it's not gravitational waves. We have to deal with this somehow. And then we also have astrophysics in the data, so this is again a spectrogram, time, and frequency, and uh, you can see here GW150914, which is, uh, shows this characteristic um, signature in time and frequency. Um, and um, yes, so we need to detect these kind of signals uh, whenever they happen. We actually have two detectors, and hopefully in the future we will have more. Uh, so the advantage of this is that we deal with different data sets, which are very similar. And since the detectors are located at different places in the world, and the wave is a plane wave, then the arrival times of the different detectors will be different by some milliseconds, up to 40 milliseconds, if the detectors are located on the extremes of the detector. And uh, because gravitational waves also have two polarization states, which means they, they, they essentially carry two signals, not just one, they, the different detectors are oriented in different ways with respect to each other. And so each sees a different combination of these two amplitudes of the gravitational wave, and we can use this to improve the, the, the estimation of the signal, and we can also use the different arrival times to localize the signal in the sky. And of course, if we have multiple instruments and they all see similar signals, then we can have a, a higher confidence that the signal is astrophysics. So there is a typical scheme that we use to analyze this data, independently of the kind of signals we are looking for more or less, that's not always the case, but generally we need to retrieve the data from these frame files. We need to uh, carry out some analysis to decide if there is a signal in the data. Uh, we need, first of all, also to decide which data can be analyzed because sometimes the data is just corrupted by some uh, malfunction of the instrument or some earthquake somewhere in the earth. Um, once we have established that there is something interesting in the data, they uh, we have to estimate the statistical significance of these candidates. 
And uh, if the significance is high enough, then we consider it a gravitational wave signal. And then we need to estimate the parameters of the signal. So we need to somehow compare the data with a model, which uh, is an interpretation of what produced the signal and give us the parameters um, of the source. For example, masses of stars or uh, the distance to the source and so on. Once we have done this, then we do science. And uh, in particular, the kind of things we want to do have to do with understanding uh, what's out there in the universe, understand what kind of objects, how many of these objects there are. We want to understand if we, uh, well, we, we want to test if we really understand the processes that lead to the formation of these objects so we can make sense, uh, we can make census of sources so uh, we can figure out the distribution of black hole masses, for example. We can study how fast black holes rotate on themselves, which are at the moment completely uh, unknown questions. Uh, we can also search for counterparts of these signals in the electromagnetic band, for example. So we can look at the direction of the signal and decide and, and check if we see, for example, uh, gamma rays or neutrinos or radio waves, which can uh, tell us more about the source. And all these things are under the name of gravitational wave astronomy. So that's ultimately what we want to do with these detectors is uh, observe the universe in a way that was not previously possible. We can also use these waves to compare them with the predictions of general relativity and therefore uh, figure out if general relativity is a good enough theory of, of gravity or if we need some kind of alternative theory of gravity, which at the moment doesn't look like the case. Um, they are actually challenging in doing these analyses, even if it sounds simple, because most of the time searching for these signals is essentially a needle in a, in a high stack problem. The signal we expect in the data is extremely weak and uh, buried under the detector noise because gravity is a very weak interaction and so it doesn't interact with the, the detectors much. Sources are very far away, much farther than you can imagine. So the expected amplitude of the signal in this time series of the detector is 10 to the minus 21 or less. We also have no control on the source of the signal because we don't know when black holes coalesce. We have no idea, we have to, that's why we, we need to find, to search for the signal. And sometimes we can have some prediction, but with very large errors. And sometimes it's difficult to make good mathematical models of these signals because uh, they may require some extremely computationally expensive simulations, for example, which is definitely the case for the signal that was detected. Um, and the detector noise itself is, uh, is non-stationary and it's changing all the time because the detector is very complicated and um, it can be very difficult to make mathematical models of the noise. So deciding if there is a signal in the data or not can, can be very challenging. So essentially the challenges are computational because we have many times a very large parameter space. So we, have, we need to search for this uh, immense space for something that looks like a signal. And then we need to be sure that the signal is not caused by the noise in the detector which means we have to filter the data in complicated ways and have developed these uh, sometimes complicated models of the signals. Um, this is just a quick overview of what kind of software and libraries we use every day. So we have a big uh, library which is called the LAL uh, library, like algorithms library. This is mostly C with some Python and uh, there is a very nice uh, SWIG interface to it which we can call from Python and also Octave. Um, this contains many things like handling of time series, uh, models of these uh, black hole waveforms, for example, uh, lots, lots and lots of stuff. Uh, there are also some Python codes inside this library. Uh, and then in addition to this package, there are many codes and pipelines to actually uh, study and detect different kinds of signal in particular. So there are like pipelines dedicated to different types of signal. We have, for example, uh, pipelines looking for transient signals or continuous signals uh, mm, using essentially very, very simple models or very, very uh, applying very strict requirements on the, on the shape of the signal. We have some pipelines which analyze the data with a very low latency to make the detections uh, as close as possible to, their to the arrival time of the signal and report it through 
for example, telescopes to be pointed at the location of the source, or we have analyses which take weeks and do a much more uh, deep search in the data which requires more time. We have searches uh, which are essentially blind, so they look for any, any kind of signal anywhere in the sky at any time, or which rely on, for example, uh, the knowledge of a particular direction in the sky of a particular star that we want to study, so we can focus the data analysis on a particular direction in the sky, or if you have some other indication that there might be a signal in the data in this moment, you can then just use a pipeline which just looks at that time to do very deep analysis. And these pipelines are written in um, different languages, mostly C or C++, uh, um, some of them in Python, and this, this is what I will talk about more in my talk. Unfortunately, there are exceptions, but I'll talk about that. Um, typically, these search, as I said, they are extremely computationally expensive, so li LIGO collaboration and also Virgo, they have dedicated clusters for this kind of an uh, analysis. We also have sh shared clusters, which are shared with other experiments. Uh, the analysis which reported this binary black hole coalescence required this uh, astonishing number of CPU hours. <laughs> uh, yeah, so you get an idea of, of the scale, and the analysis was uh, spread on several uh, LIGO clusters, including the one in Hanover where I work, which is the Atlas cluster, um, uh, which is the largest cluster dedicated only to the analysis of gravitational wave data. So, I'm gonna give some details of the way data are selected. So this is the first step in analyzing the data. Uh, we need, of course, to visualize the data, so make a lot of plots, plot time series, uh, spectrograms. Um, we need to, um, to apply filters, of course, to select the frequency bands which we are most interested in, to notch out um, lines from the data which we know are not gravitational waves. We need to compute uh, very often correlations between the strain data and these auxiliary channels which I talked about to see if there is a chance that something we see in the strain data could be related to some external disturbances. The results of these investigations are typically, uh, they are called categor category vetoes, which means, uh, um, which are time segments essentially describing uh, problems in the data. So, for example, there can be from this time to this time, the data is not usable because there is an earthquake somewhere. So these results are stored in databases, which are actually operated using some client-server models based on Python, and they are also saved in very ugly XML files, which are fed by the uh, pipelines. One of the software packages which have been developed for doing all these kind of tasks is called GWPy, and it's on GitHub. This is uh, basically an object-oriented interface to uh, NumPy and AstroPy arrays, so they give a very nice interface to reading frame files and the auxiliary channels, the state of the interferometer, which can be very complex data sets. They allow you to do filtering correlation and plot using matplotlib. So this software has been used in particular for generating some daily web pages where you can see all the data. Every time I was waking up during the data taking, I was going to these pages and checking the quality of the data. Uh, I'm going to focus on the analysis which uh, reported the event with the highest statistical significance. So this is an analysis which relies on a very precise modeling of the signal. So the signal from this kind of systems, so binaries of compact stars which spiral into each other and merge, looks like this. This is time, and this is on the y-axis. You can see the strain amplitude as observed by the detector. Initially, as the two masses are still quite far away and they are orbiting each other and getting closer and closer. They produce a gravitational wave signal, which looks like this. So it's a kind of quasi-monochromatic signal starting from 10 hertz, which is the lowest sensitivity of the detector, low, the lowest sensitive frequency. This can last for uh, from under a fraction of a second to 30 minutes, depending on how heavy the two objects are. And eventually, they will get closer and closer. The frequency will go up and they will sweep through the sensitive frequency band of the detector until they will touch each other, merge, and this will peak the amplitude and frequency that we observe. And then the final stationary black hole results, and this is uh, in a kind of excited state, which means it's, a, it's not a spherical black hole, but it's deformed, and so it has to ring down like a bell and radiate gravitational waves, which is this ring down part, this X 
exponential waveform at the end. And this waveform depends on many, many parameters. So there are, there is, for example, simply the time of the merger. So just a time shift. There is the orbital phase at merger, which is just a phase shift, not very interesting. There is, of course, the distance and the sky location to the source, the farther away the signal, the, the source, the uh, smaller the amplitude of the signal is. There is the orientation of the orbit and uh, very important parameters, which are kind of intrinsic to the source, are the masses and the uh, intrinsic angular momenta or spin of the two objects. So these control the time scale and the shape of the waveform. And this is actually what we want to learn. We want to, right, we want to get uh, to the masses of the object. We want to know how heavy they are, how fast they spin. There can be other physical effects which are not so important. For example, if the orbit is not circular and eccentric, then there are, the waveform is more complicated. If one of the objects is a neutron star, then it can be destroyed by this process. So there can be, the waveform can be very complicated because all the matter gets dispersed in a cloud. If there are magnetic fields, this can also affect in a tiny way the waveform, but these are typically uh, ignored because the, because the detectors are not sensitive enough at the moment to be sensitive to these effects. So how do we search for this kind of signal in the data? We have to explore the whole data set and decide if we have a signal like that in the data. So the way we do it is based on the maximum likelihood approach, this is quite famous. So we need to evaluate something like this. So we need to take a segment of data. We need to take uh, uh, our model waveform and convert them in the frequency domain. We need the spectral density of the detector noise. We calculate this. We integrate this in some frequency band where the detector is most sensitive. And we calculate this quantity, which is essentially a signal to noise ratio for this particular signal model. And it depends on the parameters which I just described, the masses and everything. So this is actually just a correlation between the signal and the data is nothing very fancy. It's just done in the frequency domain because that's very um, efficient computationally. So the problem is essentially computing these functions everywhere in our parameter space. And whenever this value is larger than a threshold, then we have candidate signal with corresponding to that parameters. And we put it away and we continue the evaluation. Uh, there are some tricks to do this efficiently. For example, some of the parameters can be dealt with analytically, the um, amplitude and phase of the signal, for example. The search over the arrival time of the signal can be implemented very efficiently with a fast Fourier transform, but that's basically it. The rest, we need to just keep calculating these points in the parameter space. So it's a kind of brute force operation. This means if we have uh, some search space in our parameter space here, so this can be, for example, the mass of the first object and the mass of the second object, we want to search for signals in some range in masses. We need to repeat the evaluation of rho at different points in this parameter space. And these points are associated each with one particular waveform we have to search for. And of course, you can imagine that these, there is a balancing here because we don't want to have too many points because that would be unfeasible. But if we have too few, then imagine having a potential signal here. If my nearest point is very far, then the uh, SNR will be reduced with respect to having a point here. So we will miss the signal. So we need a good enough number of points, not too large, but not too small. And so there, is a, there are kind of decisions that need to be made here. In the search that was done, we had about um, uh, 250,000 templates, so many fast Fourier transforms. Fortunately, though, we can break the data into independent segments. We can break these points into independent sets, so this is very easy to parallelize on, on a cluster. This is not enough, unfortunately, because this quantity rho is also affected by the instrumental uh, artifacts we have in the, data, in the data. So if we see something above a threshold, that doesn't mean that we have a gravitational wave. This statistic is sensitive to gravitational waves, but it's also sensitive to garbage in the data. So we need to some, some other, we need to calculate some other number which tells us, does the signal really look like the signal? The, 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 does the data really look like the signal we are looking for? This has been uh, done in a very nice way, which has been invented by my boss many years ago. Essentially, you compute the SNR, but instead of using the whole frequency range, you break the frequency into different bands. You compute this 
partial SNRs in each frequency band, and then you ask, do these, uh, are these partial, set, partial SNRs all consistent with the full SNR from the whole band? And by doing this, you get a kind of chi-square test, which is like a goodness of fit test in some sense. And then this quantity, uh, when this quantity is large, then the data is inconsistent with the model. So even if the SNR is very high, we know we don't have a gravitation wave. We use this quantity to weight the SNR uh, with some formula, which has been found to work very well. Uh, you can see in this plot an example of what I'm talking about. This is a few, um, a few fractions of a second around the time of GW150914. The blue curve is the SNR statistics. So you can see typically when the data is dominated by noise, there are some fluctuations in SNR. And at some point, we see a big peak here. So this looks like a signal. And then the green curve is this chi-square test. So here, the data is not consistent with the signal, not consistent, not consistent. And at some point, this quantity becomes one, above, close to one. So this moment is consistent with the signal. And then it goes high again. And in this purple line, you see the weighted SNR, which uh, in this case behaves like the SNR because the signal is in gravitation. Uh, since we have detectors, we need to repeat this procedure uh, in, the two, in the two detectors. And we expect noise to produce candidate signals which are uncorrelated between the two detectors. So, um, uh, because there are no, um, we don't expect the physical processes of producing the noise to be uh, affecting at the same time two very far away detectors. But we expect gravitational waves to produce triggers in both detectors. So, the way this is done is we, uh, we go through each template, each model uh, waveform. We get all the triggers within uh, some travel time compatible with the dimensions of the Earth, so the distance between the detectors, which is about 10 milliseconds for LIGO. And when we find triggers in this time window, we uh, combine the SNRs and we get a network um, stat um, detection statistic, which we can use to proceed with analysis. Uh, this is computationally is very, is very trivial compared to the previous steps. This is not a problem at all. Uh, but noise can also introduce uh, coincidences in the detectors just because you know, it's a stochastic process, so sometimes you will get some coincidences. And so the key in deciding whether you have a gravitation wave or not is asking often does the noise produce coincidences. And since the, uh, the noise is so difficult to model, these cannot be calculated, so we have to measure it from the data, which makes the whole problem quite tricky uh, conceptually. But it's actually quite easy to do in, in practice. So we simply take the data from one detector, we apply a time shift to it in a way that no gravitational waves can contribute to, that, to those triggers because uh, they wouldn't come at the correct time. Then we repeat the coincidence, and uh, what we get in the result must be noise because gravitational waves cannot be there. And in this way, we can, we can repeat this many times with many different time shifts, and we accumulate uh, a distribution of ranking statistic, and then we compare the um, unshifted coincidence to this distribution, and whenever we find one with a sufficiently small for sun rate, everybody becomes very happy, and everybody loses their uh, weekends. Um, then something that needs to be done is also estimating the uh, um, the sensitivity of the search, and uh, this is done simply by uh, simulating some signal, adding them in the data artificially, and then uh, running the search. And if we find the signal, we know, uh, what the sensitivity is, we repeat this many times. And in this way, we can find bugs in pipelines. We can compare the different the sensitivity of different pipelines. And in the absence of detections, we can actually do some science and rule out some models predicting a lot of gravitational waves, for example. Uh, this whole mechanism has been implemented in a, uh, in a software called PyCBC, which is on GitHub, and you are welcome to, to look at it. This was the main offline search for binary merger signals in advanced LIGO, and was fundamental for discovering the signal, because although it was not the first pipeline to report the signal, the signal was so loud that it was detected by an unmodeled, much simpler detection pipeline with a very low latency, but it was just was because of PyCBC that the statistical significance was high enough to claim this, the detection uh, as such. This is the evolution of a mix of Python and C code used previously. And uh, 
which was very difficult to maintain and develop further. So switching to Python made everything much easier uh, to play with. We can very easily uh, introduce new modules if we need to. Uh, for example, I've been personally experimenting with storing this data in MongoDB and Cassandra databases uh, in a very simple way. PyCBC is composed of a few modules and many executable scripts which call these modules. They also call the LIGO algorithm library C wafer model via SWIG. Uh, we have a few algorithms, unfortunately, which are hard to code up in Python efficiently, so for that we rely on SciPy's with inline uh, C code. We, since we have this on GitHub, we made some Travis tests to make sure we don't break anything when we change things. And finally, for running the production analysis, we used something called PyInstaller, which is basically something that packages the Python interpreter together with your script and all the dependencies into a single kind of standalone um, binary executable. So we can be sure that the production codes actually do what we want to. Uh, a nice thing about PyCBC is that we, uh, we devised a way to have the same Python code run on different computing platforms. So if we want to run these, these very simple operation, get some time series, multiply them, we have the concept of computing backends. So this same script can be executed uh, based on NumPy. It can run on GPUs using PyCUDA and it can run on Intel MKL. This is done by having these context objects. So if I want to use GPU, then set this to a CUDA scheme, which is a special class. Otherwise, set, this, set it to a uh, CPU scheme. And this internally manages uh, some states, and this with statement has some enter and exit hooks which define, which redirect these calls to different implementations with different, uh, these different backends. So this allows us to run the same, the actual same code on, on GPUs, for example, and it just works. Um, so how does it work in practice? So uh, PyCBC first reads the configuration file, which is very long. It finds the location of the frame files, queries the data segments uh, database for the data quality and defines which data segments we want to analyze. Then it creates a hierarchy of jobs and input and out, uh, output files using a package called Pegasus, which is a, a Pythonic and Java uh, very complicated thing, but it works really well. And this Pegasus concretizes these uh, abstract tree, um, or rather directly, a cyclic graph of dependencies into um, a workflow which can be executed on a cluster under the uh, Condor job schedule, which is used on LIGO clusters. And when we actually start the execution, is, uh, the first operation is the calculation of the SNR, so the, the equation I showed. This is done in parallel. This is the time, so the data divided into time segments. The templates are grouped and each one of these tiles is a different job which independently calculates SNR and looks for single detector candidate triggers. So yeah, any jobs. Then uh, each one of these jobs reads the data, filters it, does some conditioning, calculates one of the models associating with the first template via SWIG, multiplies the data and the template, does an inverse Fourier transform to get the SNR time series using one of the computing backends, uh, finds the maxima on the SNR time series. Uh, this is done with some SciPy with C code, computes the chi-square signal consistency check, and then goes to the next template, repeats this many times, and at the end you get uh, some candidate triggers, you save them to a HDF5 file, and uh, that's it. Then uh, when this SNR calculation is done, which is by far the most dominant part of the computational cost of the search, the post-processing jobs start. These take the triggers, they merge them into some huge HDF5 files containing uh, many, many triggers, but we have no problem, it works really well. Then some other jobs do the coincidence between the detector and then calculate the significance and store the results in, again, HDF5 files. And then some final jobs do a lot of plots, diagnostics and spectrograms and time series and frequency spectra and so on, and we use some Templating uh, modules in Python to generate some summary pages and um, see if we have some signals in the data. The most important final results plot is something like this. So here you see the basically the combined SNR from the two detectors and the number of events on the y-axis. This is the distribution of the triggers we get basically. This is 
a distribution of noise triggers from shifting the data by um, physical times. And the orange squares are the triggers from when you don't shift. So those are the foreground to potential signals. And when we analyze this data, we found this guy here, which is louder than everything else in the background. And from this, we can calculate the statistical significance, which is greater than 5.1 sigma. And so we called it, we gave it a name. This was a detection. You can see that the second one is also quite far away from the background distribution. And this is another interesting signal which was found, but the statistical significance is not high enough to claim it a true detection. But it's something else interesting in the data. Uh, then we had to estimate the parameters of this detection. This is an inference problem given the observed signals and our prior assumptions on its parameters give me the posterior distribution on the parameters. This is basically a Bayesian inference problem. Uh, and this uh, is done by some code which is, does a Mont uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo integration. One is inside LAL in C. Another one is called Biestar implemented in Python. The result you get, for example, is the posterior distribution on the masses of the two objects, joint distribution and marginal distributions here. You can get the posterior distribution on the sky, and so on. Uh, then finally, the events we get, they are stored in a database called GraceDB, which is an online database of candidates. It's written in Python and Django, and uh, different pipelines can contribute to events in this database. And uh, also there is another Python code called LD Alert, the notification service. Time a gravitational wave candidate is uploaded to this database, you can subscribe, get a notification, and something similar is attached to something called the um, GCN uh, network, which uh, also notifies about uh, detections in other uh, fields, not only gravitational waves, like gamma ray bursts, for example. And um, I want to conclude first with something that you can do. Uh, you can go to this website and download the data containing the event. There is an IPython notebook, which shows you how you can filter the data and plot it. So this is what you can get. So take a look and uh, see how the data look like with your own eyes. And one last thing I want to advertise is Einstein at Home. It's a project of my institute. It's a Boeing application for analyzing gravitational wave data, mainly used so far for uh, searching for continuous waves, uh, continuous gravitational wave, and also radio uh, data analysis and gamma ray data analysis. But now PyCBC is being uh, tested on Boink, and it runs on Linux and Windows so far. So uh, take a look, join, and you may find the next gravitation wave. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> and I want to play a movie of a simulation of how the two black holes probably look like. So this is done with some numerical relativity codes. You can see the two black holes orbiting, spiraling, and this is the uh, geometry of space-time being affected by, by, this, um, by this phenomenon. And light follows the uh, curves of shortest path in this geometry, so it gets deformed because the geometry is being deformed. At the end, the two black holes merge, and this is your final stationary black hole. Thank you, thank you very much. Sorry, maybe I took too much time. No, no, no problem. You're perfect in time. So we have time for questions. So it looked like the actual like event you measured was like seconds long. How Fractions of a second. So how did, how far ahead of time did you see that this was possibly going to be happening so that you could try to be ready to measure this fraction of a second thing? Um, so the point of the detectors is that they are always ready for potential signals. So they measure data. You have some data analysis pipelines which analyze the data continuously, and they try to, be, to have as low a latency as possible. So they are essentially watching the data all the time as fast as possible. Every time they see something that may be a gravitational wave, they immediately upload the event to these databases, and everybody gets a notification. So we, they, the data analysis can 
must be essentially ready all the time for any kind of signal, which could come any time. No, 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 this was completely unexpected. <laughs> the first person to be notified of this event is actually a, a, an Italian colleague of mine, which is, works at, at my institute. He just got an email from, this, from the search pipeline he was working on, and this happened in the morning, and he looked at the data, and he said, this looks like a detection, uh, it must be a So he went to another colleague of mine and asked him, are you guys doing some tests in the data? Are you simulating some signals? And the colleague said, no, not that I know of. <laughs> and then everybody got notified and people started looking at the analysis. But this was a very uh, unexpectedly loud event. So typically, you also expect to detect things with, you know, weeks later, such as the PyCBC the pipeline, which I described, is a high latency analysis. So you take the data for some time, and you, you analyze it later, and you take your time, and all the checks, you check that the plots that the, the PyCBC produces look correct, and only after everybody has approved that this looks okay, uh, the actual content of the data is revealed only at the end, when everybody has agreed not to change the analysis anymore, because otherwise we would be introducing some um, statistical biases in our results. So it depends. If you are lucky, you can see a signal immediately as it comes, and is sufficiently strong to be detected by the real-time analysis. Or if not, then you wait some weeks and you see it in the offline analysis. Questions? I have a lot of questions, but uh, I will be short. <laughs> so uh, you uh, you uh, store the data. Uh, you you are storing only the triggered data, or uh, a lot. Uh, uh, how huge is the storage of uh, of the data acquired? Yeah, no, the the whole raw data is is actually kept because you know in twenty years somebody may invent some incredible algorithm which can detect everything in the universe, so we want to keep it. Uh, the amount of data is, so it's 16 kilohertz, uh, double precision, basically from the whole time, so I don't remember the exact numbers, but then there are all the auxiliary channels, so it's many, I think some terabytes, and maybe, maybe one, one terabyte per day. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, for each detector, you, you, you get one tera per day, but only adding all the auxiliary channels, because here, at the end of the story, your signal that's interested is H, so the strain, it would be a single channel, but then you add, I mean, thousands of, uh, mostly environmental monitoring uh, channel that you have to check for. But anyway, at the end of the story, you are one tera per day. And normally, you keep uh, a buffer of six months of those data, at least locally, so you can look at them all the time and then you store them offline in the, in the computing center. Yeah, that final product is just fractions of a second. Uh, any other question? I have one, indeed, if nothing else. Oh, sorry. It's, it's only uh, a nerd uh, joke. <laughs> uh, have you investigated if, uh, so, sorry for my English, if uh, the, uh, the break in the space-time, uh, I don't know if uh, physically exact, could be created by the, the, by the coming back to the future of uh, McFly. <laughs> it's about the same time, October 15 <laughs> versus September 15. <laughs> well, <laughs> if, if he did, then he's gone a long way because <laughs> this thing was very far. Admit it, you actually did this just so you could detect when the TARDIS arrives, right? We hope to detect my, many more. <laughs> nice presentation. Um, I would like to ask, um, you need a very, very violent astronomical event to detect this. And how likely or how frequent are these events in the universe, and therefore how likely is to see another gravitational wave signal in the data. These events are extremely unlikely. 
So if you consider one galaxy, they, they are essentially, yeah, <laughs> they, they never happen. So the point to have a sufficient number of detections in your data is to make the detector so sensitive that you monitor a huge number of galaxies in the universe. So the more, let's see. Yes, the more we make this curve uh, smaller and smaller, then the more, the more far away we can see with our detectors. And the num so you basically explore a sphere whose radius is given by the inverse of this curve, roughly, and there, is, there are some integrals in the middle, but you can imagine that the lower this goes, proportionally you get a higher distance to which you are sensitive, and so the number of galaxies inside this sphere goes as the third power of the distance. So if you make this 10 times better, then you can see a thousand times more galaxies. And so even if the probability of one of these events in a, gal a galaxy is very small, then you observe millions and millions of galaxies, then this becomes you know, something you can measure in, in a lifetime. So based on this detection, the rate, the inferred rate on the detections of similar signals has a still a very large uncertainty because it's just one event, but you know, we analyzed some months, we saw, we reported one event, so you get an idea. We, and the detectors will get better and better in the next data analysis runs, so we see hopefully one signal per month or so. Any other question? If I remember correctly, when you showed this slide, you say that there is a uh, some noise at 60 hertz because it's American uh, instrument. Yeah, that's didn't... the frequency of the national power grid. Ah, okay. <laughs> Which couples into the detector and one of the noise sources. Um, so I don't know how long this uh, experiment will run, but since you just spoke about lifetimes, uh, what do you figure what will uh, improve most in the next years, hardware or software? So your detectors or your models? Uh, as a data analyst, this is a <laughs> hard question to say. No, I think, I mean, the biggest improvement I think can come from, for this kind of signals at least, comes from better and more detectors. Because, you know, you make this a little bit lower and you have a third power which blows up the effect. Data analysis, we are not too far from the optimal search we can do. So this search, is computationally expensive, it's not the best thing you can do, but there are ways to get an estimate of how much the best thing you can do will be compared to what you can do now. And I've done that as part of my thesis, and you could gain maybe 30% or 50% in the number of detections, but the biggest improvement come from better instruments. And especially if you have Virgo instruments, then you can, uh, you can localize the signal in the sky better. You can be more sure that it's real. So biggest improvements, I think, will come from better detectors. Okay. Unfortunately, time is over. So thank you very much again, Tito, for clarifying. <laughs> How many clarifying? <laughs> thank you so much. Um, we will have a short break of five minutes just to change room and talk. Um, here, uh, we're gonna have a talk about building Pi da Pi data pipelines. Okay, by Marco. So, thank you very much. <laughs>